when I got tired of selling houses full time, I wanted to flip and I did it again. I found, uh, it was a good friend of mine. His name's, uh, his name's Brent. He's a, uh, a high producer and a, and a fix and flipper here in the Valley. And I literally picked his brain, gave him deals, didn't take any money. And I, all I asked was, was take me along, like, show me how you do this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Keeping It Real Estate. I'm your co-host, Dan Breezy, and today we have Marshall Nathy joining us on the show. Marshall is a former ASU football player turned thriving real estate entrepreneur in Phoenix. and balancing his ambitious career goals with family life, Marshall values both professional success and personal fulfillment, supported by his wife and young son. His journey exemplifies seizing opportunities and adapting to challenges with determination. With that said, Marshall, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, you bet. So Marshall, maybe can you share a bit about your early days before diving into real estate? You're a real estate agent and you were just telling me you guys are top 20 as far as transactions go. But what were you doing prior to that? Maybe you can hear a little bit about your football career. Sure. So uh, I guess kind of taking you from A to Z. I'm not a small human. So I was rather, I've was i been large kind of my entire life. With that came kind of high expectations as far as sports goes. So I always was very familiar with training hard, Um, and put it, you know, intentionally having aspirations to go a certain direction. We never did anything just lackadaisical. There was always a goal in play in mind. So through that, I ended up being a very exceptional high school player. Um, I ended up getting recruited by a handful of different colleges. I had offers from Stanford, Louisville, ASU, because fortunately I was also pretty intelligent. So that gave me some value. And I ended up staying local. My father was a big ASU fan. So once they offered, I remember calling my pop up and he was crying, super excited. We went to the uh, the senior day there all together and we actually signed together. Him and I signed the commitment letter to ASU. Once I got there, I found out very quickly that I wanted to be very successful in business, but I did not love football anymore. I wasn't nearly as confident there and then as a human as I am now. So that was, I mean, for a long time, that football was my identity and I had to find a new identity. So from there, it pivoted to just being an exceptional human being that really attacked the path that I wanted to head. And with that came, um, I got a free master's. So I medically retired. I herniated three discs in my back, broke three vertebrae. I've had like both my hips on. So I've done a handful of injuries and I'm still pretty young. I'm 27. Well, just turned 27 and I really quickly found out I didn't want to play football anymore. So finished up my degree, got my master's, um, actually got my MBA, was going to go to law school, took the LSAT, actually got an exceptional score. I have no, I don't ask me what the, don't ask me what the number was. I have no idea. Um, but I do remember I had a full ride offer to ASU to go to law school. So if, if I was a normal human, that's probably the direction I should have gone. But I'm not normal and I've never wanted to be. I had no intention to be. So realistically, I was talking to my agent at the time, my real estate agent, when my wife and I were purchasing our first house while I was finishing school. And I asked him, because again, you know, anybody who says you're in this game and there's not a heavy impact of the financial capabilities of how much you can earn, you're a liar. So I was authentic in the fact of, hey, Kevin, how much did you make um, this last year? And he's told me 90000 And I was looking up average incomes for lawyers and whatnot. And you're looking at between 130, 150. But I got to go to four more years to earn that income. So I said, you know, I'm going to get my real estate license. My story started the same as everybody else. I had six months with a mentor who wasn't a mentor, didn't really teach me anything. Go put an open house sign and wish for the best. I was a, a very good. So I actually had a few deals within that period. I then found a mentor um, who really, well, he couldn't get rid of me is kind of more of what happened. I was had a separate office next to him. And I one night while he wasn't there, I moved my desk into his office space because I knew that he was at a level that I eventually wanted to get to. And the only way I could do that is if I became him. And I literally spent 12 to 14 hours every single day I went where he went. I had the conversations he had. I even ate what he had because I wanted to be that. And I I just, there's no middle ground. I was just, I need to get there. So I learned quite 
a lot. And my first year, I ended up doing about 37 transactions, which it was like top point zero 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 one of like first year producers, which never mattered because our, our competition's not that impressive. So those numbers really don't mean anything because again, low level of entry into real estate is low and that's just common knowledge. And through there, I stayed with him about another six months, started Bridgestone Homes, as you can see behind me. This is my personal company that I branded out about three years ago now. Um, my first year did about 70 something transactions, probably about 26, 27 million in production, just me. Two years ago, we did probably about 45 million in production, about 100 transactions. Last year, obviously, with the downturn, we did about 32 million in production, but our PL jumped about 36% because we actually went lean and we went virtual. So I had no more assistant, no more office space. I do everything without leaving my home. And this year, we'll pro we're probably going to close somewhere between 170 and 200 transactions. So yeah, and here we are. That's awesome. Can I ask real quick before we keep going in the real estate direction, what changed in your perception of football to make you decide you didn't want to do it anymore? I didn't want to have a football career. What, what happened there? I have my strong suits and football. I was very smart and I was honestly, Dan, I was pretty mean. And that's why I got recruited. I was a very mean player. And I just, I didn't like that person anymore. And to be honest, it was button heads with now my, my wife and been with for seven years. And now the mother of my son, it wasn't somebody she wanted to be with, but and every, some people may say, yeah, you shift, you change for somebody else. But the reality was she put me on a path that like, Hey, this doesn't seem like who you authentically are. So why do you continue to do it? And we actually had a big fight with it because I felt like I've just wasted eight years of my life by getting to this point to play D1 football. And I'm just going to kind of toss it down the drain because you go to D1 football to go to the NFL. And she said, you know, this doesn't have to be your identity. And I was like, well, you're right. And to be honest, I was hurting, dude. I was like, there was mornings where I could barely get out of bed. I was, and I'm, I was like 22 at the time. My back was constantly blown out just discs and broken vertebrae. And I ended up tearing all my, both my labrums and my hips had huge bone growth that made my hips like rectangles instead of sockets and balls and sockets. So outside of the pain, I just recognized that there was a much larger ability to earn with my brain rather than my body. Great. Understood. And then, you know, you did something a little bit unique in the sense that before just jumping into college, because that's what everyone did, you, you thought a little bit and assessed what does it take and what kind of income can I make doing this versus that for a training. And then you found somebody. What I like what you did is that you found somebody and you obsessively trained with that person. Did you get paid or did you just work for free for the knowledge and experience? For about six months, I didn't make a dime. But again, you know, my wife, again, she just, I mean, she's a superhero. Like she, she was working night shift. She was an RN. I didn't give her nearly as much credit at that point. Um, and now being a little bit more mature, I'd like to think, I recognize that she carried the family for quite a while. We, would, we wouldn't have been paying our bills. I remember we used to budget $150 a week for groceries because we had no money. Mm -hmm. And I knew that some of the people I saw in the real estate space, if they could do it, I definitely could do it. And I just had to figure out how to do it. Yeah, I love that. You know, I think... Uh you can collapse time frames if you can find somebody who's kicking ass in yep. the path you want to be on and you know go work them for free give them 6 months a year and obsessively go at it and you'll come out a different person and you'll pick up their habits and thought patterns that they have on a regular basis to create the results they're getting and uh, I think yeah. that that tactic can be pretty dang useful and I I can't think of many people when someone rolls up and you're committed to a goal and you want to work for free, it's pretty rare that someone will say, no, I don't want to show you anything. I don't want to teach. You. It doesn't even anything. make sense. Cause the reality is, is that if you can provide value without costing them anything and not only costing them nothing, dude, I made that dude a lot of money because yeah. I would book him listing appointments. I would just, because I've always been a hunt, you know, a kill what you eat type um, agent. I really, I have very limited production on fear or referrals. I'm very much so concentrated on PPC, concentrating on your cost per lead, your CPL, 
figuring out exactly what you put in, how much you want to get out. You're four dollars in, ten dollars out, and so we were constantly on the phone. And yeah. I booked him a lot of appointments. Yeah, and you know, I think the thing to listen to you guys. Obviously, we're a multifamily real estate podcast here, but what we're talking about right now can be used in any anything. It doesn't oh anything? Be, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Any any single thing you want, go find somebody who's doing a great job at it and add value to what they're doing. And well, uh, the reality was, Dan, something I didn't even tell you, I did it twice. So when I got tired of selling houses full time, I wanted to flip and I did it again. I found uh, it was a good friend of mine. His name's, uh, his name's Brent. He's a, uh, a high producer and a, and a fix and flipper here in the Valley. And I literally picked his brain, gave him deals, didn't take any money. And I, all I asked was, was take me along, like show me how you do this. And then I did the same thing with portfolio stuff in Missouri. Found a high producer out there because I was like, I need rentals, but I'm broke. So when I started out there, I was found somebody who was doing the Burr strategy, which you know most of you guys all understand, but it's like house hacking. You put a certain amount of money in, just like you're flipping it, but instead of flipping it, you refinance it, you keep the property, you pull out your cash. And just this last year, we put about 22 houses in the portfolio and we paid zero money. It's great stuff. So you start Bridgestone now, which is your yep. firm. Yep. You guys did 70 transactions year one, if I heard right, 100 Correct. transactions year two, then it stepped down. What did you do in year three? Obviously, market change. What did you do just so I have the data? Yeah, year three, we did, I think it was 86 and like 32 or 33 million in production. Um, but what was more important is our P&L. So our net, our NOI, whatever you want to call it, our P&L jumped about 32% because we did all that, but I fired everybody. So I created a VA, a virtual based business model. So I could keep a lot more money and do less business. Yeah. So your, your revenue went down, but your profit went up. Correct. Your, your revenue, you, you, you made less income, but because you were leaner and more efficient, you had more money at the end of the year. Correct. Right. Yeah. So you have 170 to 200 you're planning on doing this year. So give us a little bit like what, what are some things you guys did or what, what were the biggest, you know, takeaways of, of making your company more efficient? Well, one was VAs and one and another one, you know, that piggybacks onto that concept of is slowing down to speed up. Most people who are high producers, they're going to run themselves into the ground because they don't want to take the time to slow down, to press the loom button in your top right of your Windows chat and record what you're doing to teach somebody else to do what you what they what you need them to do so you no longer have to do it. Most people aren't willing to do that. And I've seen people literally drown and burn their business to the ground because they weren't willing to slow down for six months to get somebody trained enough to do what they no longer wanted to do. And that was a big lesson for me because I had to hire and fire six different VAs, which if you're familiar with placement companies on VAs, that's expensive. Like that's if you're talking $2,000, $2,500 VA, and in 60 days, they're still not doing what you need them to do. And I was the person that was blaming them. Like, hey, they don't understand. It's a cultural difference. Hey, it's not going to work. I, I can't get them to do what I need them to do. But in the reality, it was, it was me. I wasn't training them. I wasn't giving them the resources and the, and the blueprint to be successful. And what's more important is they couldn't be successful for themselves, which in turn, they couldn't be successful for me. So like, because I didn't care about their personal success as an individual... They couldn't give me the success I wanted to see. And that was a big lesson for me, something I had to implement. Yeah, I got you. So you slowed down to speed up. I love that. Um, you, you did more training. And then, I mean, really yeah. what you're saying is you built a team, right? You hired folks. Correct. Could be more of you and you replicated yourself. Is that pretty much fair to say? Yeah. So I was told don't go the normal traditional team route and I took it to heart. So I have a full-time showing partner or full-time listing assistant. I have a full-time ISA. So my job and kind of the most valuable thing I was ever taught was resale real estate is like a, a relay race. So like, let's say you're swimming five laps of a relay. What's your lap? And my lap is getting people from booked appointment to, hey, do you want to buy to pre-qualified, let's go look at houses. So I leveraged out all the other roles that weren't that. And lo and behold, we became much more successful. Nice. That's beautiful. So do you use any technology right now? Is there anything that you've implemented recently that's drastically helped your business? 
Recently, no. Um, over time, though, is a really I have a really kick ass CRM, um, and everybody understands CRM, but we have automations for everything. So when as simple as I have a 15 minute conversation with a client, it's not the first conversation. I have a tag in my CRM where I can press transcribe. My VA knows to check that box every day to see what notes do I need to take on that property or on that file, that person for Marshall. And we have two um, AI generators online, one for taking notes, one for summarizing it to where I no longer had to type notes. Because again, the whole intention of everything we've implemented was automations and systems to allow me to stay in Marshall's lane, which is talking to people and getting them from booked appointment to look to wanting to go see houses. So I got rid of everything that wasn't that and not got rid of, but leveraged it out. So automations and um, integration. So just APIs, anything that had an open API integrated into my CRM to where now for dialing on Mojo, any notes we take in Mojo, any tags we implement into Mojo, which is a, a triple line dialer for who doesn't know, integrates automatically into our CRM. Because when you get to a certain level of production, that two, three minutes, or more importantly, your brain power of, all right, now I'm going to pivot from talking high level conversation to now I'm going to take notes and now I'm going to put them in the CRM that takes away from your ability to produce. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, look at, looking back here, what any lessons you learned while playing college football, because that's a pretty pivotal point in your life. Like you just yeah. said it, your identity was that you were a football player. And I, I can relate to that very well because I was a professional snowboarder for almost 15 years. And, and when it oh, yeah. en ended, it was very scary for me. And my identity was that's who I am. That's what, that's what I was for about and everything about me. What, what, it, what lessons did you take away from the change from college football to being a real, uh, real estate agent? Probably three things particularly come to mind. One is do what you got to do. You think I wanted to wake up at 4.30 a.m. when it's cold as shit outside and go into the bubble and sprint? No, definitely didn't want to do it, but I had to. It was, and same, so that lesson re reverberates into my business. Do you think I want a cold call every single day? No, but that's what produces money. So I do. If you think I want to talk to booked 12 booked appointments every day, no, but that's what produces business. So I do. That's item one. Item two would be there's nobody. There's not, not a person on earth that will outwork me. Nobody. My wife knows, and we've had our tussles about it, is if something needs to get done, I don't care if it takes me 36 hours. I won't sleep till it's done. It has, if it has to get done, it has to get done. I'll get it done. And three is honestly understanding that it's okay to be in the shadows a little bit. I don't come from a ton of money. I come from very middle class, just really hardworking folks. Both my parents were firefighters for 35 years. They had four children. All of us were massive. I remember they had like $500 a month or excuse me, $500 a week going to Costco and like they didn't make a ton of money. And I was constantly trying to keep people updated on to, well, now I'm doing this and now I'm doing this. And then trying to teach people right as I started seeing success to, hey, you know, you could come do this too. You know, I want to take care of you. And I just had to get very comfortable just being in the shadows. Like if I'm making the money I want to make and I'm doing the stuff that I want to do for me and my family, the only person I care about if they know about it or really are updated is the woman who's holding my son right now while he naps is that's all I care about. And I had to get super comfortable. I love that. You know, I think one thing that comes to mind for me when you talk about number one is do what you've got to do. 4.30 a.m. sprints for football is you know, one thing to think about is that it's not going to be easy more than likely. Otherwise, everyone would be doing it right. It's a, it's a basic concept. But the piece that I would add to that to think about is how can you get your desire up so that if your desire is so strong, you, you want to go do the work. So it's a piece that I think will separate the folks from doing decent to the guys you can't compete with or gals is when you want it so bad. And that doesn't mean it's always funny and you're not always going to want to do it like you're describing. But if you can get some of that in your gut, in your heart, where when it's time to do the work, you know, and you feel this is what I want to do so bad, you're going to have some results that are going to be mind, mind blowing for sure. Absolutely. Big yeah. goals is what I always categorize it to. My big goals, I want to jet. So that's always been, that's, I mean, literally my goal has always been, I want to jet. So I, I always think about that when I'm doing stuff that like, Hey, you got to go make some extra money. Cause you want your jet, right? So I go do yeah. what I need to do.
Yeah, and there's something about when you put a clear goal in your mind and go chase it down, some th- things, magic starts to happen. You know, obviously creation's a process. It's not going to happen overnight. Nothing great does, but something happens with the work month after month, year after year, and chasing down a goal. I, I mean, you can hear my voice. I get excited about I've clear goals. Absolutely. It's a universe. It's yeah. a universe, dude. It's like I'm sure with your snowboarding career. It was like, it's what you put in is what you put out. If you're constantly putting in like, dude, I know I'm going to get here. I know I'm going to get here. I just need a little bit of guidance on how to get here. And if you just go do this, just the stuff that has to get done, like the universe is going to give you exact, they, they, the universe is begging to, they want to give you exactly what you want. You just, the person you envision that has everything you want, that has the life you want, the family you want, the items you want. You have to be willing to become that person. And if that person is not going to be the person sitting down at 6 p.m. watching Netflix for four hours, shocker, you can't be the person sitting down watching Netflix for four hours. But if you're comfortable being, hey, my guy in the future is watching Netflix for four hours because I like to chill, dude, more power to you. That If that's who you want, that's who you want to envision, dude, go for it. But if that's not you think, hey, Marshall in the future making flying on a jet. You think I'm watching Netflix for four hours? You think he is? No chance. So you think I am? No chance. Yeah, that's good stuff. I, I'm, I'm with you there. You got, you got to have that obsessive focus towards that goal. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, some significant trends that are happening in the real estate market that you're seeing right now. You know, what trends have you seen change over the last couple of years, or, or and where do you see it going from here? Well, that's a very loaded question. I mean, we could talk about the elephant in the room that buyer compensation just got released. So we'll see. I mean, that's a very simple conversation. I'm not sure if it's the same. I don't even know if it's the same for commercial. If you guys are well, so you're multi unit. Are you guys technically commercial or no? Yeah, we're commercial. So I, I don't know what that even means. Elephant in the room, buyer compensation just got released. What does that mean? Okay. So, um, yeah, so the NAR just settled on a $418 million lawsuit. That's the word. $418 million lawsuit. They settled with consumers across the country, NAR specifically, National Association of Realtors, in the conversation that's been going on for a few months that sellers were misled to believe that they had to pay a buyer broker, which is the broker representing the buyer of a transaction. That has officially, at least here in Arizona, starting in July, the compensation that has been there for 30 years on the MLS saying that, hey, this is what the seller is willing to pay, that goes away now. So you have to have, just like you're having a listing appointment, which you buy multifamily, so maybe you don't know what I'm saying, Dan, but you can imagine when you're, ha- when you're selling a property, an, an agent's going to come present to you how they're going to sell the property. It's always been a standard for the listing side. It's never been a standard for the buyer side, except for the the individuals that concentrate on it. But now it's the pivotal occurrence that buyers are going to have to be treated the exact same way. They're going to have to get a presentation of, hey, here's my value. Here's what I offer. Here's what I charge. And you're going to have to go hunt what you eat. You're going to have to go negotiate your own compensation, which a lot of people are going to be uncomfortable with. And it's going to be another opportunity to learn. So that's going to be the biggest adjustment. So help me. I'm trying to follow. This is so foreign to me. So you're saying yeah. that there was a time where there was a set fee or people thought there was a set fee and they passed yeah. a law that says no more of that. There are no yeah. set fees. There is none of that. If you want to buy a home, let's see, I do. Yeah. I go to you and I say, Hey, mister, I'm going to, I'm going to buy a home, but I'm only going to pay you 1%. Will you take on my work? And then at that time you decide, yeah or no, or there's negotiation up front. Exactly. You've never had to do that before because the seller, the listing agent always negotiated the buyer broker's compensation when they sat down on the listing presentation. That's not the case anymore. The buyer's agent is going to go negotiate either with the buyer or negotiate individually with the seller and listing agent that, hey, what are you offering? Here's what I charge. How do we negotiate this for me to get paid what I want to pay? And when most agents producing anywhere from 10 to 14 transactions a year are buyer's agents because they're just one deal a month and I'm good. They are mostly buyer's agents and they don't necessarily, not saying everybody, but they don't necessarily have the skills to counter that. And it can be very intimidating. And I know it's the, the sky is falling here in Phoenix right now for MySpace. Wow. 
man, sky is falling because of that, because of the, because of the law that was passed, but you see it as an opportunity because folks are going to be able to handle it and you guys will. Absolutely. We've been implementing the solution to this for years because the reality is, is I constantly have been doing consultations directly with a consumer where I, I go over A to Z of, hey, here's what the process looks like. Here's what my team has to offer. Here's my 24-7 service, all virtually, meaning you're never waiting on me. I'm here to take care of you. So if you want to see a house at 7.30 p.m., I have a showing partner ready to go to open that door. I don't care if I'm putting my son down for bed. I'm still going to be available because my team's available. So we provide that value and we have that conversation. Hey, this is what we charge. 99% of the time we can get it paid for by the seller, but there's going to be that 1% where that may not happen to where I'm going to tell you, Hey, Mr. Buyer, seller's not willing to pay me my 3% that you and I agreed to. So either we need to find a different house or you got to make sure you're prepared to come out of pocket that compensation. Got it. I love it. So when you're hiring team members, like you're describing here, what are some qualities you're looking for or what are some things you see you have to train on a regular basis to get your team members to perform? One kind of the most basic is just being comfortable, being uncomfortable. There is situations that even I don't want to be in, but there's conversations that have to happen that I don't want to have. Like when you're talking about compensation, I'm telling a buyer, I'm telling a first time home buyer that, Hey, there's a chance you and I may have to have a conversation of you paying me money. Yeah, that's never comfortable, but at the end, of, I have a business to run. So it's comfortability being uncomfortable is kind of the one. And two, it's the ability to be confident in who they are. Now, I need somebody who's willing to work because I'll lead them to the pond. But if they don't drink water, that's on them. And I don't, and just to be clear, Dan, I don't keep anybody on my team that's not producing a certain amount or not doing uh, what's called KPIs, key performance indicators, as anybody with a business understands, or especially in sales, you have key performance indicators. If they don't hit those three times, they're gone. So I have very strict parameters and I try to take the emotions out of it. So that's the goal at least. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. So what, what have you found or what have you been able to do to help people get more uncomfortable? Because I could agree with you there that it, it, it can be challenging for folks at times to step out of their comfort zone. Anything you've seen or that has been a key piece that, that has created, you know, more leaders in that, in that field. Yeah. Training by fire is always my favorite. So with their first two weeks with me, they have uh, 500 dials a day, every day for their first two weeks. And they have four open houses a weekend for their first two weekends. So they have two open houses Saturday, two open houses Sunday, four open houses Saturday. I don't care. Four, op four open houses have to happen and uh, 500 dials a day, every day for your first 14 days with me. Most people don't make it past that. Yeah. What, what, what is the percentage of people that make it to 500 dials? You say so 500 dials in, in, in 10 business days. Is that really what it is? No, 500 dials every day in 14 days. Oh, so they, they make 500 dials every single day for 14 days. That's cold calling. That's, that's um, expired listings. I don't care what they are, but I have a VA that's trained to review all numbers, all mojo dials, who made how many phone calls. Um, so, so you're asking for yeah. 7,000 phone calls in 14 days from people yeah. who are committed. Yep. And what, what percentage of people do you, you know, generally see making it through that? Probably about 70%, mostly for the fact is I don't bring them on if they don't have at least some level of belief that I think that, all right, I think you could do this. And you know what's funny is what they'll see very quickly is I'm doing dials right there with them. Wow. Well, that's serious. That is, I mean, that sounds, sounds to me like you have got to have some persistence. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to sell homes, sounds like you got to get on the phone. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So confidence, you know, how do you build their confidence? Anything you found, yeah. anything that you, you're seeing? I mean, it, I would assume that as you do 7,000 phone calls, your confidence level is going to go up through repetition because you're going to figure out what doesn't work very quick, quickly and adjust. But what, what yeah. do you, anything else that you do? Well, honestly, the one is, again, I'm, I'm in their pocket. So this isn't a go do as I say, this is a do as I do. So it's, I want you to watch me. First, you know, I'm going to dial right, right alongside you while you're dialing. I'm dialing. You're going to listen to my phone calls. I'm going to listen to your phone calls. So I think that naturally gives a level of confidence where they're not stuck in this little corner of the office, ripping their dials with nobody there to support or guide them. I'm right there with them. Dude, you're having, that was a tough ass phone call. 
go take a five second breather, do some jumping jacks and then get, get your ass back on the phone. Like I'm the person there like, Hey, th- we're still on the, sh-. like, we still have goals to accomplish. You said you wanted to do this. I'm teaching you how to do this. Let's keep moving. And having that immediate reflection with them that like, dude, yes, some phone calls are going to f- suck. That's okay. Like, Go take a breath. I'm I'm still here. I still got your back. Get your ass back in here. Get back on the phone. Let's keep moving. Yeah, I mean, the way I hear that is that you got to have some grit. And I think that, again, carries over to anything in life is is what do you want and how bad do you want it? You know, it comes yeah. back down to your desires and your goals. And with that persistence and, and, and working with somebody side by side, I really... I really admire the way you train because I think it'd probably be a lot harder for you to convert team members if you were like, here's 500 names for the next 14 days. Come back and let me know how it is when you're done. I'd probably probably be about a a 5% success rate versus a 70% success rate. And some people do that, dude. Some people want those folks that they can go do it on their own. I don't necessarily look for that because- you're coming to me as a leader to show you how to do this. Not tell you how to do it, but show you how to do it. If I'm not a producer, how can I expect you to produce? Great. So before we part ways, I'd love for you to give our listeners a book recommendation. You know, something that's made a positive impact for you. Any recommendations you can share? Quickest one, profit first. If you actually want to do this and you actually want to make money, you need to know how to allocate those monies because I will give you an example. My first two years in real estate, I made over a million dollars. Guess how much I had left after those two years? Zero, baby. So Profit First teaches you how to take away the psychology of, as a human, we are taught from a very young age, eat everything on your plate. So if you have all your money in a single bank account, you see, let's say let's say for the, the normal person, you see $40,000, $50,000 in your business account. You're going to spend a ton more money than you would if you didn't know that, hey, 10,000 of this is to my marketing budget for the next six months. 10,000 of this is to my personal compensation on my W-2. 5,000 of this goes to my assistant. You'll spend a ton less money if you understand that it's not $50,000. It's really only like $7,000 that are still sitting there in your bank account. So that was a big shift for me. I love that. I love that. We'll, we'll have to check out that book, Profit First. And you know the point that comes to my mind is... As you get into, you know, p- kids who are young, you're young and you've, you haven't blown it by getting into massive debt potentially. You know, you own yeah. a big home, you're underwater, you got a huge loan payment for college, you're underwater, you got a huge car payment, you're underwater. Yep. That's a tougher thing to come out of. But if you're young yeah. and you're getting into the space and you start making decent money, because then it, 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 clearly it's, it's possible through hard work, a million bucks yeah. in the first two years. I mean, that's a serious chunk of change. Yeah. Well, what to do? One of the wealthiest guys I grew up with, I asked him, what's the most important thing as I get going? He said, it's not how much you make. It's what you do with the money you do make. So yep. you can take those funds and think of it as a seed money. Think of it as just the beginning. You making a bunch of money is now your job is to take that money and go put it to work to pay you every month so you don't have to work again for that same amount of money. Or if you yeah. take that money, you, I made a million bucks. I got 500K after taxes and expenses that I can invest and I go, you go buy one sweet car or a big home. Well, now you got to start again where if you take the 500 grand and get it into an asset to produce passive income, ideally you can get some depreciation, just pay a little less in tax legally by the laws of the way the U.S. is set up. Legally. Uh, yeah, now, yeah, now you've got streams of income that are working for you while you're still working. That's your path to freedom. Get your I love your freedom. statement, Dan, when you said you never have to work for that money again. That that right there is a power statement. Like yeah. it ain't sexy dumping two hundred grand into a house that maybe makes you a thousand dollars a month, but that two hundred grand, guess what? It's not going anywhere and you have an extra twelve thousand dollars a year coming in. That's it. That's the name of the game. Build your passive income above your living expenses and you're free. And now you can focus more of your time, more of your energy doing stuff you love. So thank Absolutely. you so much, Marshall, for coming on and joining us on the show today. If our listeners want to get a hold of you, how can they reach you? Honestly, go to Instagram, Marshall underscore Nathy.com. It's either myself or my team. It's not the sexiest site right now. I'm working on it. I'm hiring some expensive people right now. So bear with me, but I always answer my DM. So shoot me a DM. Um, I'm always, always open to answer questions. 
Thank you so much for joining us on today's episode. We hope you found it both informative and entertaining. If you did enjoy the episode, we'd be thrilled if you could share it with your friends and family and anyone you think that would enjoy it. And your support means the world to us. It helps us bring great content and great guests on the podcast. And don't forget to subscribe. Stay up to date on our latest episode. And until next time, thanks for listening and take care. 